Praise the Lord. Well, we're rolling right along here this morning as we get into, I think, what will be our final message in this series called The Seed. The Seed. Can y'all smell those burgers yet? Yeah. Yeah. They may not even be cooking, but like sensory, like I'm expecting them, I'm anticipating. So I feel like I smell them already. I probably don't. But I feel like I do. Amen. I hope you're anticipating the word like that. Amen. Bring me down just a hair, Jason, if you will. Let's pray as we get into this. Father, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to come into your presence. And just to get into your word, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to feed us. To feed our hungry souls, Father, as we get in, into your presence here around your word. May we have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you want to say to us today. And we give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have enjoyed this series. Bring me up just a hair now again, Jason. Somewhere in the middle there. I've enjoyed this series, The Seed. I've really enjoyed it. Yep, down just a smidge. There we go. We're going to get it. Now, y'all heard me earlier as I had the mic on and I was making adjustments back there. And Abbott went and God said, I think your mic's on. Two or three people mentioned it to me. It reminds me of when this technology first came out. That pastor that went to the bathroom and left this thing on the whole time. He came out and everybody's looking at him, you know, so praise God. I didn't do that, right? Hallelujah. Thank you for that. All right, well, let's get into it here this morning. We're in part five of our series, The Seed, part five. And we've been talking about this thing, a seed that starts so small, what God can do through it. And, and, and listen, and it goes all the way back to Genesis the Lord, we're not talking about a law as in the Ten Commandments law, but some, some would say the world would even say the law of nature. You know, and God, there, there is no mother nature. It's Father God, amen? And, and Father God established this way back in the beginning. He says, as long as the earth remains, there will always be seed time and harvest. And we can see that in the natural seed, that when a natural seed is planted, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. How many of you saw some of that Major League Baseball game the other night called the Field of Dreams? I watched the opening of it and a little bit of it, and I was, it was so cool. I just couldn't get past the corn. Like, they planted that corn just for this, and they timed it out in such a way that they knew that t- corn would be peaking in its state of green and standing tall in those stalks so that those players could walk out of what looked like the Field of Dreams from the movie. I thought that was so cool. But, you know, listen, those stalks of corn, as beautiful as they were, they all started out as just little bitty seeds. It's amazing, right? And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural principle, but it's a spiritual principle that the seed of God's word gets on the inside of us and it grows. And listen, sometimes the seed that grows in us isn't necessarily good seed. Sometimes there could be a seed that got planted in you that wasn't supposed to be planted in you. Maybe something someone said to you or over you. And that's been a seed that's germinated in your life and, and it's, it's produced something that, that God never intended for you. Maybe someone said you were slow. You know, they, they, was it Albert Einstein that his teacher wrote to, to his father and said, listen, your son is, is basically an idiot and, and you know, he, he can't learn anything and he, is, he was brilliant, you know. It's a good thing that he didn't stay with that. It's a good thing he didn't let that seed germinate and grow. But sometimes there's things we have to overcome Good seed or bad seed is going to, if, it, if planted, if received in the, in the soil of our heart or the heart of our soil, vice versa, it's going to grow and produce something. And what we want to see happen is we want that to be good seed, good seed. And ultimately, Jesus is the seed. He is the word of God. He is the seed of God planted in our hearts, which is that field that produces a harvest. And as he said, the best kind is that that produces a harvest of 30 60, and even 100-fold, even 100-fold. As we round out part five this morning, I want us to look at things from a little bit different perspective, a different perspective. And I struggle with this message a little bit this morning. I want to get ahead of myself, but I've titled this message, All the While, All the While. Let me, let me get into it here with you, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7 is our key verse. And I want to read it to you from, from three different angles. The first one is the New Living Translation. Listen to what it says here. It says, this is, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He, saw, he said, I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting 
or who does the watering, what's important is that God makes the seed grow. Now, in my notes, I didn't make, re- I, I've got NLT for the next one, but this is actually New King James Version. Listen to this one. It says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? So the Apostle Paul says, hey, you know what? Regardless of where you got it, one of us may have planted it, one of us may have watered it, but at the end of the day, we don't mean anything. It's all about God who causes the seed to grow and to bring increase. And I want you to look at this final version from the Amplified Version. This is the one that jumped out at me big time. It says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God, and I've got this in big bold, but God all the while was causing the growth. So neither is the one who plants nor the one who waters anything, but only God who causes the growth. Isn't that awesome? And so I just kind of lifted that out of the Amplified, those three, three words, all the while, all the while, all the while. The seed part five, all the while. Now, who is this guy, Apollos, by the way? Who is this? And if you were here a few weeks ago, it's been a, maybe a month or two or three. I don't even remember how long ago. Was I did a message, and I really talked about these particular verses that I'm about to read to you in detail. But, so I, but I just felt like the Holy Spirit wants to bring them up again. And I want to look at something, though, maybe from a little bit different angle. And the perspective by which Paul most likely wrote that verse. And I want you to look at this. Now, Apollos, who is Apollos? Who is Apollos? Who is Apollos? Well, we're going to look at what the Word says about it. Let me give you a little history. The Apostle Paul, uh, empowered by the Lord and called with the mission of taking the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles, Gentiles and Jews, is going around the known world sharing the gospel. And he finds himself in this area of Greece called Ephesus. And somewhere along the journey, he teams up with his husband and wife team, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Who was the, who, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. So Priscilla was the wife, I'm thinking, and Aquila was the husband. Not really sure, to be honest with you. Their names are kind of close. But Priscilla and Aquila, real people, and they made tents. They were in the tent-making trade, which we find in Scripture that Paul had experience in that as well. And there were some seasons where he bivocationally worked while he shared the gospel. And he spent some time with his husband and wife team, Priscilla and Aquila, and they're making tents. But in this tent making process, in this, in, this, in this business that they're doing, conducting, Paul is teaching and discipling this husband and wife team of Priscilla and Aquila. And so they get to hear from the Apostle Paul firsthand, who they didn't know at the time, would be the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. But, but Paul is discipling them and he's teaching them about the gospel and about the good news. Meanwhile, and, 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 and we don't have time to read all of it, but in Acts chapter 18, you'll see the story where Paul leaves Priscilla and Aquila at, at this area called Ephesus, and he takes another trip to go to another area. And while he's gone, Apollos, a young man named Apollos, comes into that area preaching the gospel. So, so here's, here's, here's meanwhile, verse number uh, 24, Acts chapter 18, It says, now this is as Paul has left. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. Now he talked about Jesus. He taught about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. But it goes on to say in that very same verse, however, he only knew about John's baptism. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately to Apollos. Now it goes on to say that uh, it really doesn't even give us an inkling, though, to be quite honest with you in Acts chapter 18. It doesn't give us an inkling as to Apollos' response to Priscilla and Aquila. Now, they, he did go to some other areas to preach, and they gave him some letters to take with him, just really paving the way for him as he would go into some other areas to preach the gospel. But it doesn't really say that Apollos got it and that he received what they were sharing with him. 
And I'm going to read you another verse in a minute that would really lead me to believe that he probably more than likely didn't. That although he's teaching very adequately about Jesus, he's leaving out the third member of the Godhead. I love Robert Morris's book titled The God I Never Knew. Because like me, many of you maybe can relate, I grew up in church and we heard a lot about Jesus. We heard a lot about God. We heard very little, if any at all, about the Holy Spirit. In fact, the only thing I knew about the Holy Spirit, whenever he was mentioned, it was always in this context. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit convicted me of that. And I only thought that the Holy Spirit came around to convict you of something that you had done wrong. It's the only time I heard him mentioned. And again, keep in mind now, he's the third member of the Godhead, and somehow he's preaching the gospel and the good news. And although he's preaching very accurately about Jesus, he's leaving out somebody extremely important and as they're saying right here in Scripture, the member of the Godhead that he's leaving out, leaving out is the Holy Spirit. And now we go on to look, look at this, in Acts chapter 19, the very next chapter. So Acts 18 ends in verse number 26, and then it goes right into Acts 19, verse 1. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to see the spillover effect, the spillover effect of what Apollos' ministry was like and as a result of preaching Jesus and the gospel minus the Holy Spirit. Here's what happened. It says here in Acts 19, it says, While Apollos was in Corinth, so while Apollos was in Corinth, so Apollos had left Ephesus and he had gone to Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus. So in other words, they did a leapfrog. They did a switcheroo again. Now Apollos leaves Ephesus, but Paul finds his way coming back to Ephesus on the coast. It says here where he found several believers. Several believers. Now, you are not called a believer in the New Testament unless you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that, God, that he died on the cross for our sins, and that the Lord raised him, God raised him on the third day. That's what makes you a believer. It's believing in that, that part of the gospel that makes you a believer. Isn't that interesting? In fact, we're, Jesus never even called us Christians in the New Testament. We're given the name Christians by another group of people, an outside group of people, that looked at believers, New Testament believers, and said they're like little Christ. And they got the, we got the name Christians from them. So really, our, our primary name for believing in Jesus Christ is believers. So Paul traveling... He meets some believers. This is very important that you see this because some would say, well, they were really non-believers. No, it says right here, clear as day, he said he found some believers. In fact, the New King James or the King James says he found some believing Jews. He found some believers. So here's what he said. So while Paul was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, and he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them? Now, I wouldn't encourage you to ask people that question today. <laughs> now, Paul did, right? But I, I, honestly, like if you meet someone in Walmart and you realize they go to a church and you go to, I, I just wouldn't advise you in today's course say, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I think it would go over like a lead balloon, <laughs> right? But listen, Paul found it important enough that even though he knew they were believers, he just asked them straight up, and I love his bold, he said, hey, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Wow. Now here's their response. Here's their response. He said, they, said, they said, no, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I can relate. And then he says, well, then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. And Paul said, and this is stated throughout many places in, in Acts, and even Jesus himself talks about this. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them. Wow. And they begin to speak with other tongues and they prophesied and there were about 12 men in all. About 12 men in all. Now why, what, what's this got to do with seed? Like, like what's this whole, like why are you talking about that dude on the day where we're talking about seed? What's this got to do with seed? What's this got to do with seed? Here's what I want to tell you this morning. I want to encourage you in this. When you find yourself in a place of disappointment, 
And disappointment is just going to happen. And see, this is, what, this is my struggle this morning. It's like, because, you know, like I'm grounding in, like, number five. And this was the, the, the verse that jumped out, me, out at me was, Apollos may uh, sow and I may water, or you could flip it up. I may water, Apollos may sow, but God gives the increase. Like, I was struggling with this message today of like, hey, be prepared for the increase. Positioning yourself for the increase, because I love God's increase on my life. Amen. How many of you, how many of you want more of God's increase in your life? Let me see your hand. Some of you, amen. Praise God. All right. For those that don't want it, I'll take yours. All right. But 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 I struggle with that because I'm thinking, man, you know, that's one of them fired up messages. We got this celebration day, hamburgers, hot dogs, and get everybody fired up with, hey, God's going to increase your life. Amen. And I believe He wants to do that. But listen to me. Sometimes. The things that stand in the way of the increase that God wants to bring in our life can be the disappointment that we find ourselves facing. And what is disappointment, by the way? Disappointment is when you expect one thing and you get something else. That's disappointment. And, you know, you've heard people say, well, man, I don't want to get my hopes up because if I get my hopes up, then I could get disappointed. I get that. I do. But that's not a good way to live. Because then you're never believing God for big things. You're never, you're never believing God for that person that he wants to bring in your life. You're never, you're never believing God for that job opportunity or that position or the, the, that child or whatever it is. You know, because listen, I was talking with someone on the phone and they were talking about they were praying about something. And the Lord reminded me of the verse where Jesus said, hey, but when you pray, believe. It's, it's one, which, which really, by the way, means that you can pray without believing. And I find that we do it often. But he said, but when you pray, believe that you shall receive and you shall have what you say. Right? So to believe is important. But disappointment, listen, if it hits you hard enough and often enough and from different angles, it's the devil's strategy and attempt to stop you from believing God for big things. And I believe with all my heart that the Apostle Paul wrote that verse from a level of disappointment. I've never heard anybody preach that, but I just, it's just what the Holy Spirit showed me. And you may say, well, how could you say that, man? How do, how, how do, you, how do, you, how do you know, like, yeah, Paulus is preaching the gospel, but he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. And Paul sees these people later, and he makes sure that they're introduced to the, to the person of the Holy Spirit. I get that. But let's go back to a few verses that lead up to that main verse. And this is found in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. Listen to this. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, and I can almost hear the anguish in his verse, or in his words, as he writes this verse. He's like, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. He said, I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. Doesn't that prove, doesn't that, prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Uh, 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 I missed the verse. He said, he said, he, he said, you're still controlled by your sin for life. And then, 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 then he describes how they're operating. He said, you're jealous of one another. He says, you're quarreling with each other. He says, doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When, when, when one who says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I'm a follower of Apollos, Aren't you acting just like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? And who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your heart and Apollos watered the seed and it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters works together in the same purpose and both will be rewarded for their own hard work for we are both God's workers and you are God's field and you are God's building. 
He's trying to give some fatherly advice and teaching to this church at Corinth. Because just like the body of Christ now, there was big schism and division within the body of Christ. And I think, and I really, I'm, I'm, I feel pretty certain, you could trace it all the way back to Brother Apollos. And I'm going to call him Brother Apollos because he's a brother in Christ. He's a brother in Christ and he did, listen, he, he believed in Jesus and he taught, he taught about Jesus accurately and for that I'm thankful, right? And he had enthusiasm and he was well versed and he could hold his own against anybody. Except, except he didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. And for what he did talk about, I celebrate. And I almost, I almost sense that this, these verses that I just read you, to you was almost like a concession speech for the Apostle Paul. I think he had probably come to a place where he had realized that although the gospel was never intended to be preached apart from the power of the Holy Spirit... I think he realized by now it had and it was causing great division within the body of Christ and that he needed to do something to bring the body of Christ back together. And he's trying to draw an emphasis and say, hey, listen, Apollos ain't nothing and I ain't nothing, but God is everything. Isn't that interesting? Because see, here's what was happening. Here's what was happening. There, were two, there was a river forming in the body of Christ and just like in our county right here, you had the south side and you had the north side. Listen, you had this, set, this, 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 this area or this big population of the body of Christ that was forming that believed in Jesus, they believed in God, but they didn't embrace the Holy Spirit. And then you had this section over here that they embraced the Holy Spirit. And listen, just this one member of the Godhead the devil had used to cause great controversy and division within the body of Christ. Now think about it. It was almost like a crack or sliver, but you've seen a movie or video where it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you go out, and it's just this massive gulf in between. And listen, sadly, I, I thought we still find ourselves somewhat there to this day. Although, although I'm really thrilled that I see signs of that lessening. And let me tell you how that happens. Hunger. Hunger knows no bounds. If you find yourself on this side of the river, but you get hungry enough, you'll end up somewhere else that you didn't start out at because you realize, you know, there really is more. And I need all that God has for me. And you step in it. That's what happened for me on January 13, 1999, as I'm a deacon in a big Baptist church in Raleigh. I'm a Sunday school teacher, sang on the praise team. I did everything they told me to do. Tithe. I'm there every time the door opens. But I'll never forget, I had a carpet cleaning business for 10 years and I'm on I-40 going from Raleigh to Durham to a carpet cleaning appointment and I cried out from the very depths of my being and doing all, doing all the stuff they told me to do. I just knew, I knew with all honesty that I did not have the power to live the Christian life. My life was so compartmentalized. I had church hat, deacon hat, Sunday school teacher hat, business hat. I'd never mixed them up. Then I had a couple of hats I didn't want anybody to see. And those hats is what was eating my lunch. I'm on my way to that carpet cleaning appointment, which I didn't even want to go to. And I'll just never forget, I just on I-40, I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I said, I'm doing everything they're telling me to do. And I'm just going to say this to you. I never talked to the Lord like I did that day. I was never that bold. I just said, Lord, I'm doing everything they've told me to do. And there's tell, they're telling me there's nothing more. But I'm telling you right now, I do not have the power to live the Christian life. And if what I'm walking in is all there is to it, this is my conversation. I said, I'm ready for you to take me out of here today. And I wasn't going to kill myself. I wasn't suicidal. But I really meant it. I knew that statistically somebody would probably die in a traffic accident on a North Carolina highway that day, somewhere in the state. I just figured, let me be one of those people. And I literally, I, I was envisioning just a tractor trailer coming across I-40, cutting right through one of them, them little chain things they had up and hitting me head on. I, I was ready. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, who I didn't really know much about, began to speak to me. And here's what he said. He said, son... What you need in your life is the same thing Peter had to have and Paul had to have. And it was like he was showing me. You know, God in a, in a, in a, in a showing 
can show you a thousand things or a thousand words. Let's say a picture is worth a thousand words. The Lord can give you pictures in your heart, in your mind, as he speaks to you, and you get it. You see what he's saying. And, and, and what he's showing me is like, Lord, he's, like, he's like, son, as you've been in church, they've always painted Paul and Peter like these New Testament superheroes. He said, but they were regular people. And, and, and he brought up the Peter for, for an example, how Peter denies Jesus three times. He swore he'd never do it, but he does the very thing he swore he'd never do. I've been there and done that. And Peter does the very things he said he'd never do, afraid, and then roughly 50 days later, after meeting the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, this same Peter, I got a new phone, y'all, and the button is so small, I think I got it turned off, and I don't, but I think I do now for sure. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, is a different person. On the day of Pentecost, unlike 50 days earlier when he denied Jesus three times, on the day of Pentecost, he stands up and preaches with great boldness, and 3,000 people are saved and come to Christ. Only one difference. Same Peter. What was different? The Holy Spirit. He'd embraced the Holy Spirit. He'd been filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. Listen, which makes, which makes what Jesus said make more sense. When Jesus told the disciples and his followers who were all ready to go out and preach the good news. And this is what they think happened with Apollos. They think that Apollos had been a follower from a distance. He wasn't in the 12 disciple group, but he was a close follower. And that somewhere along the way, he went out a little early and began to preach about Jesus. Even Jesus resurrected, Jesus crucified, resurrected, right? Because he's preaching accurately. But Jesus told him that day, he said, hey, hey, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel baptizing, making disciples. He, but, but before you do, but first, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. He said, then you'll be endued with power from on high and then you will be my witnesses throughout Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, there was, Jesus knew there was something different about us doing the gospel and us being the gospel. And see, listen, you can't be the gospel without the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you might be a saved Johnny, but I was, I was a saved Johnny up into my 30s, just like those believing Jews that believed. I was a saved Johnny up into my 30s, but it wasn't until that day on January 13, 1999, in that customer's home in Durham, which was nothing but a divine appointment, divine appointment. The Lord led me there, and here I am. Didn't want to be there. I'd asked the Lord to take me out. He's telling me what I need. I don't even know how to get what I need. I'm lost. I'm lost when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And I'm walking around this lady's house doing my job, and I'm noticing magazines and books and, and some stuff, and I knew she, right away they were Christians. And I could tell by some of the magazines and books that, that they weren't in the same camp I was in. I knew by looking at some of the books and magazines that they were on a different side of the river than I was on. But I said to this lady... Because I was really, I was like a dead man walking. I said, y'all are Christians, aren't you? She said, yes, we are, Johnny. And I said, are y'all, and I, I wasn't making fun. It's just the only thing I knew. I just said, are y'all spirit-filled Christians? She said, yes, we are. I said, explain that to me. What does that mean? I said, I'm so hungry on the inside, and I don't know. And I just believe there's more. And she began to share God's word with me. You know what she began to do? She began to share with me about the Holy Spirit like Paul did those believing Jews that had never even heard there was a Holy Spirit. And she began to share with me line upon line, precept upon precept. Got ready to leave that lady's house. I packed up my carpet cleaning equipment. I felt this unction, and I said, she's sitting right on the porch, the stoop of her back step, I said, ma'am, for some reason, I just feel like I'm supposed to bless you with this. I said, I'm not going to charge you. And she said this. She said, well, I received that in Jesus' name. Now, I'd heard people talk like that, but that was those other side of the river folks. And we just didn't talk like that where I came from. But she said it was such bold. It's like, I received that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Johnny. And then I said these words. In 10 years of owning a carpet cleaning business, I'd never prayed with a client, a customer, or vice versa. I'd never mixed them hats up. I said to her, would you just pray with me before I leave? And she said, Johnny, I will pray for you. She said, but I want to tell you this. I really believe that God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit before you leave my home today. 
And I still didn't know what that meant, but I said, okay. And she just stood right there in front of me, and I just lifted my hands. Listen, Baptist deacon, Sunday school teacher, everything they told me to do at church, I'm standing right there like a fool, like a fool for Jesus. You know why? You know what got me to that point? Because I was so hungry, and I knew there had to be more, and I knew if there was more, I wanted it and I needed it. And she began to pray with me. And just about that moment, she began to pray. Her little boy, a year and a half old, probably Jonas' age, let out a blood-curdling scream from around the corner of the house. The puppy had tripped him up on the concrete driveway. He'd fallen right on his nose on the pavement. And his, the bridge of his nose has got blood running down. She just stops and she says, hold on. And she goes and gets her son and she picks him up. She's coming around the corner. And I'm already nervous about the whole thing. This took nervous to a whole new level because I didn't know much about spiritual warfare. But I knew enough to know that the devil probably did not want that to happen in that moment. And as she comes up around that corner with that little boy just screaming to the top of his lungs because he's hurt. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but she had her hand on his head. And I heard these words as she got close enough. She said these words with authority. She said, by his stripes you are healed in Jesus' name. And when she said those words, that little boy went from screaming, crying to complete silence in a moment. Now, moms, you know a kid doesn't just cut it off like that. And I knew the Lord had touched that boy. And I'm, I'm just looking in amazement at this whole thing right here. And I'm like, whoa. And I said to her, I said, he was just healed, wasn't he? And she says this. Yeah. She said, yeah, he's learned how to receive his healing when we pray for him. One of those bold phrases. We, did, we never said on my side of the river. We didn't talk like that. But she said, yeah, he's just learned how to receive his healing. We pray for him. And she went back to praying for me. And just as she began to pray, she shared this verse with me in Luke that says this. It says, how then if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven not give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? And she said, Johnny, all you got to do is ask. And when she read that verse to me, I'm like, that verse is to me. That's not for the unsaved person. He's calling us his children. That's his children he's talking to. So she said, Johnny, all you got to do is just ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And for the first time in my Baptist life, I did. I asked the Lord to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And can I just tell you, he did that day. That was January 13th, 1999. And I know I will never, ever, ever be the same. I faced some hurdles. I faced some obstacles. Listen, I faced some disappointment. Listen, I've even disappointed myself. But I still know that no matter what, I was filled with the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, that day. And that I rely upon him as needed, as often as needed, day by day. I rely upon him to live the Christian life through me. I believe in my heart that as the Apostle Paul wrote this word to the church at Corinth, there was a great schism. He said, some of you are saying you're on that side of the river. Now, some of you are saying you're on that side of the river. He said, none of that matters. He says, don't give us glory. It's God that gives the increase. It's God that gives the increase. Now listen, that's my story about the Holy Spirit. That, I, I, and listen, I don't know why the Lord planned me to share that today that way. That really wasn't on my, on my agenda. But I just want to be obedient and share with you what God's put on my heart. And I want to encourage you this morning. If maybe you find yourself in that same place where you're living the Christian life, but it's more of a struggle than it should be, maybe you need to be introduced to that third member of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God, listen... That, that, that resurrected Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you. And you may say this morning, well, man, I, didn't I get the Holy Spirit when I believed, when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior? And the answer to that is yes, you did. In fact, you can't be saved apart from the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. But listen, here's the difference. This word that he's talking about is the word baptizos. And it literally means to be so saturated in. It's likened to a white towel going into a vat of red dye. That when it goes down in and it comes back up, bring me up just a hair, Jason. When it comes back up, you'll never get that red dye out of it. Listen, it's not about the Holy Spirit coming on the inside of you. Listen, it's about the Holy Spirit getting all of you. 
And when you and I ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, that's exactly what we're asking him to do. We're saying, Holy Spirit, will you permeate every being, every part of my heart and my mind and my soul? And he'll do it. And he wants to do it. He wants to be your helper. The Greek word for him is the paraclete, the one that comes along beside you. And you know what? I believe it was the power of the Holy Spirit that helped Paul get through that disappointment. He was probably rounding out his ministry here on this earth. And it probably saddened him to see this division within the body of Christ. But you know what? I believe God is lessening that division because hunger knows no bounds. If you get hungry enough, you're going to eat. Amen. If you're going, listen, if you get hungry enough, you're going to find something. Amen. And this morning, I hope that that hunger leads you to the Holy Spirit. I hope it does because he wants to fill you afresh and anew through and through. I love that verse. I love that, the, that phrase in that amplified version. It says this, he said, and all the while, all the while, the Holy Spirit, God is causing that seed to grow. All the while, all the while. Listen, maybe you face some disappointments. I know you have. I, I, it, look, it's not even a question. You've been disappointed. And here's a news flash for you. And I know you know this. You're going to be disappointed again. Disappointment isn't over for you. You're going to face it from time to time. You know, it, it's just going to happen. And you, like me, you may even disappoint yourself at times and seasons in your own life. But you got a helper standing by, the paraclete, the person of the Holy Spirit, maybe the God that you've never heard much about, that wants to fill you and empower you and enable you to live the Christian life. So that all the while, that seed that's been planted in you, Listen, maybe that, maybe that seed and that call to ministry that was planted in you that you've struggled with, that you haven't been able to figure out how all the pieces and the parts are gonna come together and maybe you're trying too hard and maybe God just says quit. You just let me lead you and you let me guide you. Now listen, God's leading and guiding is real funny. It usually just goes one step at a time. I'd love for him to get me to the end of it and then I'll step into it. But often he don't do it that way. He just said, no, you just, you just take the next step and then the next step and then the next step. Maybe you've been disappointed by a failed relationship, maybe a divorce or separation that you didn't see coming. There's healing for that. There's healing for that in the person of the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's, maybe there's been a close friend that you thought was that friend that stuck closer than a brother and somehow along the way, that thing went south and you felt betrayed and you felt hurt. You felt misrepresented and misunderstood. I get it. I get it. But listen, the Holy Spirit is here to help you through that. So that all the while, all the while while that's happening and all the while while you're walking through that, that seed is still going because God gives the increase. Because God gives the increase. You know what amazes me? I'm amazed to discover what happens when I think nothing's happening at all. It's usually in the moments that I think nothing's happening at all that God is working big time to will and to do his good pleasure. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning. As we take the bread and the cup and we take communion, this is our invitation. It's the way we do it every week. And why do we do it like that? Because listen, when we leave here, we don't want you focusing on yourself. If you focus on yourself, you're going to be de depressed. You're going to be, listen, you, you're trying harder ain't the answer. We got to put our faith and our hope in Jesus and the finished work of Jesus on that cross. So we're going to take the bread and the cup this morning. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that as you take that bread and that cup, you just receive new life today. If you've never started your journey with Jesus and received him as your savior, we're gonna to pray together in just a moment. You'll be able to receive Jesus Christ as your savior. Maybe this morning, if, if hurt and disappointment has got you paused, it's got you wondering what's next. Listen, see Jesus on that cross taking that disappointment and that hurt on your behalf. And because he did, listen, you don't have to. That's a burden you ain't supposed to be carrying no more. Because he did. 
And I love this because the word says, and as he is, so are we in this world. And where's he at right now? What's he like? He's victorious. And as he is, so are you in this world. Maybe this morning you need healing in your body. You know, God still heals. The same power to heal is available to us today as it was as we read about in the book of Acts. And that God wants you well and whole. I believe that with all my heart. How can you say that? Well, I want my kids well and whole. And I'm just an earthly daddy. My heavenly father, he prayed through John that above all that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's his heart for you. And by his stripes on that cross, Peter says, we are healed. So whatever it is you need today, I want to encourage you. There's disappointment there. Listen, you cast that disappointment on the Lord and you ask the Holy Spirit to fill that area of disappointment and hurt in your life to empower you to live the Christian life through you so that all the while you will see everything that God intended for your life to come to pass in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet as our ushers pass out communion this morning. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My baked beans were running over as I brought them in here this morning. I got three of the big cans and one of those metal pans. And I'm thinking, yeah, it all fit in here. It, it fits, but it's at the brim. And then my car I had to wipe up some because it was running over. Thank goodness for that rubber cargo mat, right? Listen, I pick up my communion glass right here. And it's right, I don't know if yours is like that. They were generous today as they were making these. And mine is right there at the brim. Just any movement to the left or right, they'd be running over. Listen, that's a picture of where God wants you to be. He don't want you just barely getting through this life hoping and believing God for heaven. I thank God for heaven's in my future, amen? But Jesus came that you could have an abundant life. He said in John 10, 10 that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. And that word more abundantly in the Amplified, it means to the full. Just like my baked beans, to the full till it overflows. If you're missing that today, listen, there's a good chance you need to be filled or refilled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul who wrote that, he said, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. That means a refill. I thank God, man. I thank God that I can pull up to the gas tank when the gas tank comes on, the light comes on, and refill. And I got to do it often. Listen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to be filled and you need, you need to be refilled often. Amen. We got two parts to this communion that we're holding today. Listen, that bread represents the body of Jesus Christ and all that he went through on that cross so that you and I would never have to. And then this juice that represents his blood. This is the qualifier. This makes you right with God. It's not about your behavior. It's not about what you do. It's about who you've been made. It's who you are. It's how the Father sees you because of Jesus. And Jesus paid the price for all of our sin on that cross. Even the sin that happened yesterday, it's been paid for. Now, well, how does that make you feel? Does it make you want to go sin? No, it makes you grateful. It makes you grateful. It makes me want to worship. This morning, you hold these two parts in your hand. Receive them by faith for whatever it is you need today 
in Jesus' name. As you do this, you're doing it in a worthy manner. Paul said, because those that aren't doing it in a worthy manner, there's many that are sick, some have died. So today we just do it in a worthy manner. We're counting, we're doing the math, and we're considering that this represents the body of Jesus Christ, and I'm in that body, in Jesus' name. Would you pray this prayer with me this morning? Mean it from your heart as we receive. Father, we just thank you today that Jesus is your son, that he died on that cross for my sin, that his body went through shame and depression and rejection and sickness, and by his stripes I'm healed. Thank you that he went through all that rejection by you. He was made impoverished. All those things that I could have the complete opposite. And today, I receive by faith Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I receive that full, abundant life that Jesus came to give me. And Father, I ask you right now, because you are a good Father, I ask you right now to fill me with the Holy Spirit from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, in Jesus' name. Let him feel you right there, hallelujah. And I give you praise for it all, in Jesus' name, amen. Now receive that by faith this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. With your communion cup in hand, can you somehow give him praise with me this morning? Hallelujah. He is worthy. Praise God. Amen. God bless you.